worship God this morning. Amen. We're in the book of Colossians, chapter number one, preaching on the subject Christmas and Colossae. Let's look in verse number 10 of chapter 1. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening with uh, all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, with, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us in the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, would you honor your word and the message today. Thank you for allowing me to preach the gospel and uh, to be a pastor. I'm not worthy of it, but Lord, I, I love what I'm doing. I want to help, and I pray you'd use me. Thank you for your faithful people. I pray for those, Lord, that are, are traveling on vacation, different places. Uh, God, you'd be with them and uh, uh, protect them, help them, and most of all, use them for your honor and glory. We'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Paul was uh, writing, this is a, a church that he didn't uh, start, most likely, a church he had never visited, and he's got a lot going on. He's in Rome, and he's... Uh, dealing with the authorities there, and he's, he's facing a lot of difficult things, but a problem that had, um, uh, was developing in uh, Colossae, in that church, uh, he felt like he needed to give attention to it and to deal with it, and uh, what I am, I'm just absolutely fascinated uh, uh, by what the Lord is showing me uh, in the, in the, just the last couple years or so, how alive this Bible is. This could be us. It would be, no doubt would be a different <clears throat> set of problems, but uh, God is absolutely, totally concerned with his church. Uh, and I, 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 I challenge you to not, if, if you disagree with me, investigate this, and you'll find it to be true, Everything that God does, he does, he does through a local church. Everything. And that it is God's will for us to be a part of a local church. It's easy to cop out. It's easy to not want to have that accountability. But if we're going to do anything for God, we need to find a local church that we can invest our life in, that we can be nurtured and encouraged and can grow in the Lord and we can be part of that solution and not part of the problem. A lot of the writing that Paul <clears throat> did was to correct problems. And this, this uh, from what I read, this church had a, had a little mix of, of uh, 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 mysticism, Jewish uh, legalism, and Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is a knowing, a revelation apart from the Word of God. And it always creates a, a spirit of arrogance and, and pride. <clears throat> and so Paul is writing to correct that. And, and uh, one of the things that just really, um, uh, really gets me is just how accurate this Bible is. Just how much God knows us. I don't look at church the way I look, look at church. Uh, I see us. Uh, I see us in this, local, this particular local church, the Independent Baptist Church, as a book in the Bible. And that we are, uh, we have good things and we have bad things, and I don't always know what they are, uh, but uh, God knows, and I can preach sometimes and uh, hit, hit the nail on the head and, and don't even have a clue <laughs> that I did. I know that just from experience, that God is the author of instruction, and he's teaching, and it's exciting because he cares about you, he knows about you. Uh, we, the, thing about, the thing about school, any kind of class, college or 
uh, high school or elementary school or whatever, the thing about it is you get a grade. You get a grade. And you're, you're doing this good or you're doing that good. A lot of people are into competitive things, you know, and uh, like athletics, and you get a grade. How, how do you compete? How, how good are you? You don't really find out how good you are till you compete. And you really, we need to, we don't want to face that, but we need to face that. We need to say and look at ourselves in the Bible and say, okay, that doesn't really line up. And uh, it, it's just so exciting because there is a fix for a problem. I had, uh, I had something on my mind, something I'm dealing with uh, recently in the last week or two, and uh, I said, Lord, I need to read something that will remedy what I'm dealing with. I want a fix. And I remember I, I've said this a lot, the Bible is, is a medicine, and I encourage you to take your medicine. And I just prayed about it, and probably it's something I've read, no doubt, in the past, and was in the kind of in the back of, the, of my mind, or maybe the Lord just directed me there. But at any rate, he direct, directed me to the book of Colossians, and I started reading in chapter 1, and then what I found, my answer was in verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. We need to stay focused on the Word of God and primarily in what he's talking about here, is the will of God. Find out what the will of God is for your life. And we, we, uh, we could have preached on Mary. Uh, one, of the, one of the wills of God for her life is to carry the <laughs> baby Jesus, the son of the living God, uh, in her body and deliver him and, and uh, nurture him and feed him and clothe him and raise him up. She was carrying God. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty cool thing to do. And by the way, let me say this, as, as a mom and as a dad, you have a responsibility and you have the privilege of forming a human being, encouraging a human being, and giving them hope. Uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing to be able to, to, to teach your children the greatest thing in the world. And that's, God is important. God loves us, and, and I want to seek him. I want to get to know him. It's a journey. And it's, and it's an investment. And we invest our lives in teaching people about Christ. I had a, I, I mentioned the other day, what was it, Wednesday night, Sunday, and I'm getting really cold on my witness, and I got preoccupied with other things. I'm getting back in there. We got to, we got to talk with uh, uh, two Uber drivers and a Lyft driver. One of them we got to pray with. And they're a captive audience. <laughs> and so we got to talk to them, and, and Joel prayed with a, with a man, and, and all of them got a, uh, 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 the plan of salvation on our door hanger. They got that. said, this is... You know, I know you can't come to church, but please read this. And on the, uh, on the plane coming back from California, uh, I had uh, uh, a setting with two people, and the, the, the young man, Brandon, that sat on this side was not saved. He was probably, I don't know, maybe 25, a little older. And uh, the lady on this side, Jasmine, who from California lives in Lacey, we had a blast. They laughed at everything I said when I was joking. And that keeps me going. And then we got on the subject of Jesus. And uh, she said, yes, I'm a Christian. I said, well, what do you think about Brandon over here? I said, you think we should share the gospel with him? We're sitting on the back of the plane, just perfect. And she said, well, I, yeah, she said, I should be. Our preacher preaches to share the gospel. I said, well, I'm going to show you how to do it. Of course, he's smiling but he's getting the gospel. I said, what I want you to tell uh, Brandon is that Jesus loves him and Jesus died for his sin, and we think it's important uh, in our life that we trusted Christ and we want to share the gospel with you. And so she didn't actually tell him that, but she said, that's right. 
<coughs> people embarrass easier than I do. I don't know that. It takes a lot to embarrass me. <laughs> that didn't do it. But we had a, I, I felt better about myself. But just dealing with, with battles, dealing with things, and, and God led me to the scripture, and it, it's a fix for a problem. There, there are fixes for the problem. Uh, I, when, when you got a health problem, uh, my wife, don't call Dr. John, call my wife or my daughter. Because they look, they look stuff up and they know, uh, Stephanie one time went to the doc, doctor and she's quoting all these medical terms. And he looked at her and said, are you a doctor? She said, no, I read a lot. And so, <laughs> self-diagnosis, but we need, to, we need to get a fix. We don't have to be unhappy. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be doubtful. There is an answer for everything in the Word of God, everything that's important. It, there's an answer here in the Word of God. And it will enrich your life when you realize we're living. We're living epistles. We're living the Bible. There's a chapter in heaven <laughs> or a book in heaven on the Independent Baptist Church and every other gospel preaching church in town, there is a book, so to speak, being written. We can determine our level. <clears throat> Just like the thermostat in the back, uh, we can turn it up and make it warmer. We can turn it down uh, in the winter and make it cooler. We can turn the air conditioning on in the summer. We control the spiritual temperature of this church, what temperature are you comfortable at? I, I, I gotta be in, I gotta be in a church that uh, the potential, at least the potential for revival, the honesty of the people, the introspective look and say, you know, this needs to be changed and that needs to be changed. God help me. I want to do something for you. I want to grow. So this is a solution to a problem. And it's just exactly what we have today. Some things are different, but there are problems in churches. I, I mean, there's some churches, and you say, okay, preacher, why are you preaching this? Because it's important, because it's God's mandate, because if I don't tell you, you won't know. We've got to know what the problems are. And the Bible calls it like this. Folks are cast about by every wind of doctrine. That is, they're sailing in one direction, a cross wind comes, they catch that wind, they go this way, and it doesn't allow people to grow. There's a truth. There's a truth in the Bible. I want to know what truth is. I want to get answers. Anybody enjoy being miserable? I see that hand, Vic, Hart. Some people like being miserable. I think I don't want to be miserable. And when I don't have answers to what I'm dealing with in my heart and mind, I get miserable. And I start looking and saying, wait a minute, God, this doesn't make sense. And God says, because you're not looking at it right. And that's what he did with this. You have been delivered from the power of darkness. Darkness has a power. There, there's a strategy against you. You're not just lollygagging through life and choosing this or that. There are forces at work in this world to separate you from God. There are forces at work in this world to hinder you and to slow you down because if you ever catch fire with the word of God and it becomes a priority of your life, the devil's, listen, we worry. We, we look at ourselves of being fearful of Satan, being fearful of, of the people of Satan. But that's not what it is. There's a fear going on, but the fear is in Satan's fortress. And the Bible says, the gates of hell, the gates have to do with the fortress, shall not prevail against them. We are not in a castle surrounded by a moat and surrounded by armies who are besieging us and starving us out. We are the ones on the move 
around the enemy's fortress. Amen. They have to adapt their strategies to a witness in Christ uh, honoring a Christian. When we witness to people, uh, Brother Art mentioned it this morning. Uh, I got here late, but what little bit I heard of it. Uh, talking about the, uh, the influences of, of your witness and people around you here that you're not even aware of. I try to think about that. Sometimes if I sense that people are around me are listening to a witness, I'll turn the volume up a little bit on that get saved stuff. We can be victorious in this life. And we are, we are oppressed. We are, Satan has a strategy to separate you from the Word of God. He has a strategy to separate you from fellowship. Is it working? It's not an accident. See beyond this what you can see. There are spiritual forces at work. You wonder why you get down? You wonder why you... You, you, you think you get your perspective. I battle it all the time. I mean, I'll, I'll be on cloud nine spiritual and I'll go through something and I'm like, Lord, why? You know what we, we need to know? Number one, God saves us. Jesus saves us. God loves us. And God knows what he's doing. Can you repeat that with me on three? One, two, three. Oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> we don't even need to practice that again. God... No. Nope. One more time. We're almost there, Kathy. God. God knows what he's doing right now, okay? God knows what he's doing. Right now. He knows what he's doing. He's running this thing. When you're going about your daily chores and your daily life and, and the mundane things of this life and the fun things of this life, Every step you take, God has a plan to get you back close to him. To get you witnessing again. To get you working again. To get you walking again. He says that it is God's will that you might be filled with, a, uh, might be filled with the knowledge of his will. It's a reason for your existence. You know, we were made, created for God's good pleasure. And if we don't grasp it, do you have any idea how much work it is to be lost? How much work it is to try to, I remember, I'm, it's like a different person. I remember, I get where I, I meet people and I thought, I used to think like that. I, that's how I know I'm saved because I used to be like that. I used to think like that, and I don't now. It doesn't make any sense. When, when people uh, are, are struggling so hard to find uh, the right philosophy of life, and then they, they cling to it and they make it true. We don't make this Bible true. Bible makes itself true. If I accept it, good for me. If I don't, it's still true. Though the broad road is filled with millions of people headed the wrong way, there's a, there's a narrow road that leads to eternal life for you there be that find it. It doesn't matter what people think or what doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right, Christian. Listen, Lean not into your own understanding. There's a fix for that attitude. There's a fix for that misconception. Lean not to your own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. We were made uh, to, to make God happy. And God will make us happy in that pursuit of serving him. And, and by the way, in Christians on their worst day as martyrs, when you read it, and I've been reading about that, Christians who were martyrs, my word, with joy, in the pain, in prison, burned at the stake, would sing songs to him. There was something bigger going on on the inside than was the outside. Jesus is our example. He said, 
I do always those things that please the Father. I said this the other day, and it just, I was telling that young lady on the plane, there's a battle going on within us. We're trying to pull our life back because we're thinking maybe there's a little element of our life controlled by us that will make us happy, that will fulfill something. It's a scary thing. I fully understand why people hesitate to come to Christ. They know they're giving up their life. And that's a good trade-off. <laughs> that's a good deal. We cling to that which cannot, cannot satisfy us. And we're struggling with taking our life back. The only way we're going to have fulfillment, the only way we're going to be happy is to give ourself to Christ, to make him the priority of our life. The primary purpose of our life is to bring him pleasure. We are to live for him, and our grade one day, I mentioned that, our grade will be gold, silver, precious stone, or it'll be wood, it will be wood, hay, and stubble. We cannot accomplish the will of God in our life if we don't know what the will of God is. And see, that's what Paul's talking about to these people in Colossians. He's saying to them, the, the thing that will correct the Gnosticism, which is prideful, knowing apart from the Bible, and the Jewish legalism, which is an external, uh, and we got a lot of that in, in our churches, uh, uh, external uh, uh, verification that we're Christians. You know, we, we got something here. Well, this proves I'm a Christian. I'm holding the King James Bible. But if that Bible could speak, it would say, please put me down, you nasty thing. Get your heart right with what's written therein. So what, Paul, what Paul's trying to correct, he's trying, if they get to know Jesus, I've been struggling with something. I, I told Brother Art the other day, I get, and I mentioned to you that I get, I get these uh, problems, and I'm trying to find a solution, and God just absolutely, clearly uh, <laughs> illustrated that to me. How do we stand, earnestly contend for the faith? Okay, we're to do that. There, there are things that, folks, it's everywhere. I was, I was reading... Uh, an article yesterday, and it was on expository preaching, which is the best way to do it. And uh, I do a little bit of that, but not nearly enough. My messages are topical because topical is what has helped me. Uh, and uh, but expository uh, preaching would be go verse by verse, explain that verse, and then uh, the best version of that uh, type of preaching is to find a text. Within that verse, maybe I'm doing somewhat of that, explaining uh, what this is about. But when, when we're preaching that, it's good. And I was reading this guy, and he says, uh, seven reasons why we need to preach expository preaching. And I thought, number one, you, you know what? He's right. Number two, he's right. Number three, he's right. Then he goes on to say, now this is what I'm talking about that we are battling. He goes on to say, he says, now, you wouldn't want to use this topical message in this situation. I thought, well, that's good. And he said, you certainly wouldn't want to preach this particular topical message at an infant baptism. I'm thinking, oh, my Lord. We are against infant baptism because that's what Baptists are. And a Baptist were against infant baptism. Why, preacher? It's such a sweet ceremony. Because you tell that kid, when he gets old enough to know, hey, listen, uh, uh, I, I've been thinking about God. Do I need to get saved? Oh, no, honey. You were baptized by Father Compromiser. You were, you were sprinkled as a baby by Reverend, I don't care about your soul. And I thought, everything that guy said, he missed the point. And I've heard stuff, uh, <laughs> messages and things recently, like, well, you're missing the point. If you miss the point, nothing else matters. 
It's not helping us to preach expository preaching if our doctrine's not right. And y'all thought you were going to hear about baby Jesus today. <laughs> you cannot accomplish the will of God for your life if you don't know what the will is, if you don't know what Jesus is, he wrote in Ephesians, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of God is. This should be your primary pursuit. Do you know what the will of God is for your life? Do you know what it is? It's not just the birth and the baby. It's not just uh, what the, 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 the earthly father of Jesus did. It's not just David. Uh, 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 fighting the giant, it's not just the big, what the, the most, by the way, the best uh, service that you do in your life is not that which is seen or widely known. We love those things. It's that day-to-day -day faithfulness and walking with God and trusting God. Our primary pursuit in life, as we're struggling are to take back our life from God that we've given him. is to find God's will for our life. What is God's will for your life? Are you doing God's will? Because you've missed the point. Oh, I'm saved. I said this the other day. Some of you didn't hear. It's like saying that I'm saved and I'm not fulfilling uh, the will of God in my life, and I'm not, um, I'm not uh, uh, growing in the Lord, is like saying, somebody say to you, what, what are you doing in your life? You know, what, what, what have you, uh, what's your job? What's your pursuit? What's your desire? And you say to them, I was born. <laughs> yeah, I know, but what are you doing? What's your, what's your career? What's your goals? What are you, oh, I was born. I'm born. I'm good. I'm born again. That's the same thing as saying, I'm born again. What are you doing? There comes a time when you get tired of changing diapers. We had a cutoff, 15 years old. You're changing, you know, no more diapers. I love what my grandson Luke did <laughs> when he stayed with Hannah. He would go to the bathroom, but he'd leave his diaper on. And he found a closet at their house. Does that bother you, me telling me this? Okay. He finds a closet, and Hannah opened the closet to get her coat or shoes or something, and, and Luke was irate because he's using the bathroom in his diaper. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Joel used to, how old was Joel? We're not going to say. Joel would go to the bathroom and he'd say, I'm finished. And mom would come in there and wipe him. Let me have to wipe the kids. Say, raise your hand nice and high. How about your husband? Why no? Not yet. It's coming. When we get old. It's the same thing. He said, he used the analogy of a baby. You're born again. I've been born. I'm saved. Have you learned how to walk yet? Don't need to. Don't need to walk yet. Mom's bringing me my food. Don't need to walk. Yes, you do. You're missing experiences if you don't walk. You're missing experiences if you don't learn how to talk. Some kids should never learn how to talk. You find out what they're really thinking. I used to think Alan just loved me. But I asked him, I was telling Tom, I asked him the other day, I said, I did, we didn't make it to Upper County. I said, hey, did you miss my preaching? He said, no. Nah. <laughs> he, don't, he don't take nothing off from it. He's a heartless little kid, just like his dad. <laughs> I don't want to just be born. I don't want to have things in the church that the Word of God could correct and we're not in the Word of God enough to get corrected. Unfaithfulness, the answer's here. Loss of joy, the answer's here. 
Worry, the answer's here. Direction, the answer's here. And it works. You know, I turn to this. The Lord just impressed me to turn Colossians chapter 1. I kept reading. When I hit verse 13, it was like, bingo. Bells were going off. The Holy Spirit said, that's it. Read no further. That's what I want you to see. I'm like, oh, I am. Paul was praying for these people for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Get to know him. He's amazing. I had a talk with, I worried, had a whole list of worry stuff. You know, sometimes praying is worrying out loud. And I'm, I was last night driving down the road and I'm like, okay, Lord, there's some stuff bugging me. And I want, Lord, I want, I want this. I want you to do this. And I want to accomplish this. And I, I want this to happen. Lord said, okay. I said, am I praying? He said, yes. I absolutely am because I'm bringing it to him. Paul said that they might walk worthy of the Lord. That's a big order. Walk worthy of the Lord. You know, I, I run into people a lot. I talk to a lot of people. And if Christian, there are so many Christians out there. I'm just amazed that we're not getting, having more done and more of an influence. There's so many of us. And we assume that everybody around us is lost. And you get to talking to people. I prayed with several people. Uh, this past week, that were saved people. As soon as I find out they're saved, you know what? I said, pray with us. And you know what? Almost without exception, they say, okay. And they pray the best prayers. And I'm thinking, there's somebody else saved besides me. <laughs> but all of us are afraid to speak up. All of us hide our Christianity. Well, we need to be more outgoing with it. We need to come out of our shell. We need to give out the gospel. Paul said that you might be fruitful in every good work. What are your fruits? You know what fruit is. Is banana fruit? Let's try that again, babe. You can do better. Come on. A banana. It's a fruit. Are we going to have a debate about what kind of fruit this is? Not a grapefruit. Not an apple. What kind of fruit are you bringing forth? What is on your tree? Love? Joy, peace, bitterness, complaining, not on that tree. If we don't see it, if we don't see Christ, we can't see whether we got any fruit or not. Long-suffering, <coughs> gentleness, patience. What, you got fruit or not? Well, no, but it's okay. Why is that? Because I was born. It's okay. I've been born. I'm a human. But are you an adult human or an adolescent human or an infant human? What kind of human are you? I'm a grown up human. I can drive an automobile. Truck, not so much. Can't park a truck straight to save my life. But I can drive. I'm an adult. I can, I can go to the store and I can buy, I, I go to the store and buy stuff, shop I did last night. I can get anything I want. Yeah. I'm an adult. I went down the booze aisle and I thought, hmm, I don't think so. I could have got it. I might have some explain, explaining to do. We have trouble. I get down. I'm tired. And maybe I should. No. 
There's a better answer in here, in this book. Better than Budweiser. Better than Coors. Better than marijuana. But I need to chill. You don't understand. I got stress. Everybody's got stress. Man born a woman in a few days and full of trouble. Try the word of God. Try calling a friend and telling them what you're going through. By their fruits you shall know them. What kind of fruit is in your life? He says that you might increase in your knowledge of God. It's great getting to know God. It's great to know what God would do in a given situation. You know, we've been married 46 years, I think, and a lot of times I can read her mind. I mean, she, Kathy, I, when we were years ago, if she was mad, all I had to do, she'd come home from work in them high heels, all I'd do was hear her walk across the floor. I could tell what kind of mood she's in. And when she's mad at me, husbands, when she's mad at me, there's this glance. It's not a look. There are no words said. Tom's seen it many times. <laughs> there's this glance. It's like, and you know. You know it's over. How well do you know God? You know, I, I, think I, I, I completely flipped my opinion of church folks. And I, I, I thought, they just need to be skinned <laughs> consistently. And that's not, if you wanted to be skinned, you wouldn't be here. Sometimes we need that occasionally. But the, the thing with church folks is, they want to do right. And we are so down on ourselves. We are so down on ourselves and we're missing, we're, we're, we know God enough to know the condemnation. There's another look my wife gives me. There's a thing she does. What is that song, that thing you do? I wish I could sing it right now. There's another thing she does. I can only do that with this finger. I can't, so I do sound effects. <laughs> she does this thing when she's really happy. She walks through the house with a smile on her face, and she's clicking both her fingers like that. And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. Here we go. Going to be happy times around here. We miss the happiness that God would have for us. We miss... what. You ever send a text? Can anything be more volatile than a text? Can anything be more misunderstood than an email or a text? What do you mean by that? Ask Peggy. <laughs> Peggy sent me something one time, and I just, I don't know. Did I let you have it? I responded. And, and you said, no, 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 I didn't mean it that way. It was the other way around. No. <laughs> yeah, it was all my fault. <laughs> but it was a misinterpretation, right? Yep. <laughs> and we, we misinterpret we misinterpret things from God because well I know I know what he's thinking. He's not he's a friend, he's a good friend that comes over. I'm not here to condemn you, I'm here to help you. I've been where you're at. I know what you're going through. That's what God wants us to see. Care about you. I want to, you know, I know how you feel. You're looking down on yourself. You don't have to. Because he delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. Grow. Grow, Christians. Grow. Be big boys and girls. Eat all your spinach and your broccoli. Grow. Don't go through your life saying, it's okay. I'm a Christian. I was born. What are you doing with it? What are you helping with it? Who are you helping? Heavenly Father, 
Help us to grow, Lord, please. Help us to get to know you, Lord. We don't want to get to heaven and find out uh, how many texts we misinterpreted from you. How many messages that, Lord, you were trying to tell us you loved us and you were going to help us, and we thought you were condemning us. We love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for your people that want to grow, that want to get to know you to solve the problems and the answers in their life. In Jesus' name.